morning, church. Let's uh, worship the Lord. If you'll stand to your feet, we'll get right into it.
Welcome to the first service of 2024. Kind of feels good to get back on a routine. Some of the schools have already started. Some are going tomorrow, some Monday. But it's a new year, a new day, and we're happy to have you here. And for those of you that were going over the Sunday for the New Year's, welcome home. It's good to have you. Amen. Isn't it great to be in his house? No place like being in his house. Take a moment and just greet someone near you before you're seated and let them know you're glad they're here. Make them to feel welcome. All right. Take your seats, and while they're making the transition for the teaching session, I'll come down. All right. Just before uh, Pastor David comes to teach, uh, it's time to worship the Lord through our giving to the Lord, our tithe, his offerings, and we do that lovingly and cheerfully, always unto the Lord, and if you need an offering envelope for your giving, hold your hand high. Ushers will see that you receive an envelope. Please fill that out clearly and legibly, and um, God bless you as you as you give tonight and always for being faithful to God's house and giving. Amen. Great to be back on schedule. Tomorrow night's men's Bible study in the Mac room. And if you want to start that this year, we're studying the book of Revelation. Starts at 7. If you want to eat, be there at 6.30, right? I'm doing it right? All right. All right, let's pray over our offering tonight. And after we pray... Um, and the offering has been taken. Uh, Spanish Church, we're going to meet in the Mac room tonight, this day, not upstairs, but in the McLachlan room. And uh, you can be transitioning there, out through the uh, hallway and down to the McLachlan room. Let's pray over the, our offering, pray over your finances, over your businesses, that the Lord would bless you and keep you. Kendall, come pray over our offering. Lord, we love you. You are great. Thank you for your blessings in 2023. And thank you for your blessings that you're going to give us in 2024. Father, for the tithes and the offerings that's given tonight, we just ask that it would stretch and build your kingdom and it would be used for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. 
All right, give Pastor David a wonderful hand as he comes to bring the message tonight and the teaching. Well, it's going to be a great year. It's going to be a great year. I think I feel like this every year, but <clears throat> I like new starts. Y'all like fresh starts? Like even if it, a, a year wasn't difficult, I still like the fresh start. Fresh start. Hey, do we have the, um, can we put up the graphic that we had on Sunday for the, the Bible reading plan? Um, before we dive into the, uh, teaching tonight, I want to invite you to uh, read the Bible through completely in 2024. We're doing a reading plan. Uh, we're going to put that up on the on the screens. Uh, if you have the U Version Bible app, which I believe is just a really great tool, I encourage you to have that on your smartphone if you have a smartphone. It makes it really easy to, to break down and and check off. Tells you exactly what to read. You can uh, listen to it if you're an auditory learner and prefer to have somebody read the Bible to you. I enjoy that. I do both and try to follow along, but I like to hear it as well. Um, but I, I want to invite you to, to uh, participate with us in reading the Bible through in a year. And at the end of the year, uh, we'll have, I mean, you're going to be in, on the honor system, but we'll. Uh, recognize everybody who has completed reading uh, the Bible all the way through in a year. And if you just want the certificate and want to lie about leading, uh, reading the Bible, I don't know how to help you. We'll just be on the honor system, but uh, it's not too late to catch up. You only If you haven't started yet, you'll only be three days behind. You can make that up pretty easy. So, uh, do that with us. I feel like there was one more thing that we're also doing. Fasting and prayer. Yeah, that's it. We're doing 21 days of fasting and prayer to start off uh, this year. And I want to encourage you to do that with us. We started that yesterday, and it'll run through the 22nd. So uh, 21 days of fasting and prayer. We're, at, we're asking you to join us and at least uh, miss... One meal a day, at least. You can layer it if you want to do the whole, you know, the full-blown 21 days, you know, water only. Go for it if you want to do 6 a.m. to 6 p.m. However you want to structure it, but make sure it involves skipping meals, not like fasting, non-edible things. Um, biblical fast. I'm not going to teach on that tonight, but... And uh, su this coming Sunday, we do have Luke Holter that'll be here with us. We're going to have Sunday night service as well uh, at 6 p.m. He'll be with us for both of those. Uh, Luke Holter, not a stranger um, to around here. Can you believe Luke's been coming to our church, I think, for 10 years now? Yeah. Crazy, crazy. But we love that guy, and he'll be here uh, with us. All right, y'all ready to run after it? We're starting a new class tonight. It's called Kingdom Theology. Kingdom theology, and uh, if you're kind of tracking along with uh, Spring School of Ministry, it's a new day, uh, new class, and um, if you are wanting the actual course syllabus, please let us know. We can get you uh, the class syllabus for Kingdom Theology. I'll just go ahead and say we'll have those ready for you next week. We would have them today. But my wife decided about noon today that she would uh, take Aubrey on a last minute, our youngest daughter, on a last uh, minute beginning of the year trip to Germany. <laughs> so she is on an airplane right now, and I don't have that syllabus for you. But we'll have that next week. And uh, that's the joy of, you know, working at the airline. You can just decide last minute. So anyway. If you uh, don't see them around here tonight, 
we're not having marital trouble. She's just on a, <laughs> she's just on a trip. All right, tonight we're gonna be, gonna be talking about uh, communion. And I love this subject. It's one of my favorite things to teach. And uh, I think I say that every time I'm teaching, <laughs> no matter what I, whatever I'm teaching at the moment is my favorite thing to teach. Um, but th- the, Lord, the Lord led me to find out about some really just wonderful, wonderful ministries that have helped the truth of God's word to come alive in me. And um, you know, back in the, I guess it would have been the, the 60s and 70s, there was the word of faith movement that you know, swept across the country um, Kenneth Hagen, um, wonderful man of God, had a significant influence in his generation. And um, many of his contemporaries have been just so inspirational in my life. I didn't find out who T.L. Osborne was until after he was already passed away. And that just breaks my heart because I would have traveled anywhere in the country to, to go and get to see him and meet him and have his right hand right on my forehead and pray and declare blessing of the, of the Lord upon my life. But um, I love these guys. I've, I've given myself to um, listening to anything I can find on the interwebs that these guys teach and preach. David Oyedepo and all, all of these people have the same thing in, in common is that they have an understanding of God's word that's not religious, it's, it's like life-giving. And communion, I, 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 you know, I've grown up here at this church and um, this church for as long as I've ever been here has had leaders that love Jesus wholeheartedly. But the Lord has really been leading, I feel like our whole church on a journey of just opening, um, a new level of understanding of just how good God is and how complicated we sometimes make it, make all, like all of the things in scriptures, there are, the Bible, Paul talks about uh, mysteries that are in the scripture, they're like divine mysteries. And uh, he says in, to the church in, in, uh, in the book of Colossians, he, said, he says, to us the mystery has been revealed. To us the mystery has been revealed. And like the idea of, of, of faith, the idea of uh, the blood of Jesus. You know, we sing the songs that say the things, you know, about the power of the blood of Jesus. We we, we sing all of the songs. We do all of the things. I've taken communion my whole life. But man, a a few years ago, I I was listening to T.L. Osborne. I was just studying on communion. I was listening to anybody and everybody I could find that was talking about uh, communion, Um, reading Benny Hinn's book about uh, the blood of Jesus, listening to all of these guys teach, and and I found in, in in scripture like how important having a meal with God is. And I, I I grew up and I feel like that. I feel like that, and maybe I was just missing it, you know, maybe I was just missing it. But you know, I thought that when we did communion, we were just you know, making sure we didn't forget. You know, it was, remember on the communion table in all of the Assemblies of God churches anywhere in the world, you know, it's engraved on the front, you know, in remembrance of me. And, and I, I, that's all it was for me. It was like this religious act where we're remembering what Jesus did. And it is that, we do, we do need to remember, but uh, what I wanna propose to you tonight and what and I want our church to be on this journey together to understand that when we take communion, we're not just remembering the death and the resurrection of Jesus, 
we are, we are doing a prophetic act of coming to the table with the Lord and having, an, and having a meal. And we should take that seriously because our Heavenly Father takes it very serious. No, all of the promises that are found in this book are unlocked through communion. A promise lies dormant until there's a meal. And that's what I'm gonna be, I wanna walk us through and show you how throughout the entire Old Testament, every time the Lord promised and made a covenant with somebody, that covenant was on hold until the set time and the Lord would show up in time and have a meal. There would be a meal. We're gonna walk through some of those things. And I, I, at the end of this teaching, my prayer is that every time that you come to a, a place of the communion table, that you're not just making sure your sins are forgiven and just remembering Jesus. I want you to remember the promises that he's promised you and put the Lord in remembrance of his promises and say, Lord, all of these things that you've promised me, I'm coming to the table. I wanna start and I wanna read uh, Psalm 23. Psalm 23, it's one that we all know and love. There's one very important, all of the verses are important, but let's start in verse one. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in the path of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. And then here in verse five, you prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. This is what I want you to understand when you come to the table of the Lord, the table of communion, to have to, to meet with him in his presence and take a meal together. We're becoming partakers of Christ in this. When you come to the table, the enemies are still there, but they have to, the enemies, our adversary, Satan, and all of his minions that are coming. Listen, there is a force that is looking to sit on your destiny and on your future. And at the table, Satan cannot touch what's at the table. And this is why I believe it's important. I, I, I encourage you, to cha I challenge you, put it on your grocery list, to have communion elements at your home. Don't just wait till communion Sunday at church where we all do this uh, together. When we give you the opportunity, we always, every Sunday at this church, we have communion available. Every Wednesday, it's available. I, I, I challenge you. Anytime, anytime that you sense the devil trying to interrupt your life, run to the table. Run, Satan cannot touch what is at the table. He sits and watches, but he cannot touch. Commun communion gives life to covenant promises. The idea of covenant exemption, man, I, this came alive in my heart around 2000, probably 16 or 17. One of the first time I was watching David Oyedepo preach in uh, just outside of Lagos, Nigeria. He transitions the service out of worship. He prays and prophesies over the congregation. I love watching those people, they're so excited. He'll declare something good over them and the, the crowd like erupts with amen. It's, I mean, it sounds like that you, if you've ever been to like a Texas A&M football game and everybody's yelling the same thing at, at the same time, it sounds like that at their church. I, I, I gotta go there. But every year they have like a prophetic declaration for the, for the entire year. And I think it was, 
in 2015 or 16, the prophetic declaration is uh, David Oyedepo would say, my case is different. And when he would say it, the entire crowd would, would yell back at him, and so is mine. And then they would all declare together as a covenant child, what happens to others is not permitted to happen to me. And then they just erupt in, in like cheering and celebration. I watched that and I was like, yes. My case is different. Your case is different. Your case is different. We're not, we're not preaching this here too boldly. If Jesus gave his life to unlock, to break the back of, of the law of sin and death, then we can't take it too serious. You can't take it too serious. Well, David, you know, it doesn't work that way. It doesn't work that way for everybody. I, I can't tell you how many people that have looked at me and just smiled and looked, oh, good for you. And I'm like, no, come on, people. Understand what's in the, the Bible. All of the promises are yes and amen. Well, I know, but if, it, but if it's his will, all of the promises are yes. And they, they can be unlocked with communion. I heard this taught. I'll tell this testimony. This is one of my favorite personal divine healing testimonies. I have, I used to struggle with back pain. I've had two back surgeries. And I know what it feels like when I have a herniated disc. Anybody that's ever had that, it's not fun. And I know what it feels like. And I, I have I said this in teaching on the broadcast. I wish that I had a, a, a real revelation of the truth as it regards to divine healing before I had the back surgeries because I wouldn't have done it. And I said, uh, I said one time on the, on, uh, the teaching broadcast, which if you don't know, we have that. Every, uh, every day that we're able at 10 a.m. ish, we, uh, we go live and teach God's word, bold faith, uh, on Facebook and YouTube. You can search for my name and Worldwide Impact and uh, that'll pop up. We invite you to watch. But I said on the broadcast one time, I'm, I'm not doing another back surgery. I'm not doing it. You know, I had the one, the same thing happened again and I had the second back surgery, I'm not doing it again. But uh, I was, we have a pool table at our house. I was playing pool, bent over, and I'm telling you, I, I felt the little zinging sensation that just like brings you to your knees if you've ever had your you know, back get out of whack or whatever. And I couldn't, I couldn't even hardly like stand up. I literally just laid down on the, on, the, on the top of our stairs and Amy is looking at me and she's like, are you gonna make it? And I'm like, oh, I'm good. And you know, just any movement the wrong way just was sending, you know, shock waves down my back and into my leg. And I was like, oh man. And I knew what it was. And I told her, I said, I refuse to have this happen again. I refuse to have this happen again. And you, I know from experience when that happens, if it does subside, it usually takes days. And I'm like, I don't have time for this. Ain't nobody got time for this. And immediately, devil starts reminding me, remember that time you said that in front of all these people? Now they're gonna see you and you're gonna have this back pain again and then blah, 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 lie, 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 lie. I was so ticked off and uh, I had a meeting uh, up here at the church with two of the most bold faith ladies that I know, uh, Chantel and Bethany Hooker and then my mom and uh, Amy. We we're having a meeting talking about our homeschool program and I've got to get up here to the church and I'm, I'm not that interested in walking in and you know people in our church that we're preaching bold faith to to see me walking in like hobbling or whatever I got in my truck I got in my truck and I remembered a testimony that I heard T.L. Osborne uh, tell in his book Healing the Sick and uh, he was talking about a, a, a child that was sick. Parents could not afford 
doctors, the fever was skyrocketing and uh, the mother just prayed in the spirit in the child's ear, anointed him with oil and, and for 15 or 20 minutes until the child fell asleep, just prayed in the spirit. So I, I, I remembered that story and I was like, you know what? The whole way from 2920 and Alvin A. Klein Road to here, I just prayed in the spirit all the way here. And intermittent in English, I will not have this back injury. Drive all the way. I finally got comfortable where I could like drive in the, in the truck and you know, I'm praying through some pain. And I finally got pretty comfortable and by the time I got here, I went to get out of my, pulled up under the canopy and I, I was like, okay, I gotta get out of the truck. And as I'm like trying to ease out of the truck and not have the returning zinging pain, I realized like, okay, like this is not hurting right now. But I'm still at that place where like any wrong turn, I'm afraid to, you know. <laughs> Anybody ever been there before? Had your back go out, boy, it's bad. So I'm like, I like walk in under the canopy and walk into the sanctuary and I'm still praying. And I, and I, I remembered Benny Hinn telling a story of a man with terminal cancer that he went and prayed for and he took him communion and he brought him a bunch and he said, I want you to take communion every single day. Every single day, take communion. He taught him how did he basically taught like I'm teaching you here, the power of, of coming to the table. And uh, within like three weeks, he was, that man was released from the hospital because something had come alive in him. The truth, remember what Jesus says, I think in uh, John 6, 38. Let's try that one. Try 35. Find the one that says you shall know the truth and the truth will set you free. 32, I know it's right there. You shall know the truth and the truth shall set you free. If you find it, you can just put it on the screen and we'll all... There it is, 832. I said six, wrong chapter. You shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free. If, you'll know, if, if we can understand the truth about how powerful communion is, Jesus wasn't just trying to get us to remember how good he was. He's trying to get us to come to the table and have an encounter with him. He says, hey, come sit down at the table with me and while I'm there, I'll do anything that I've told you that I would do, I'll release it to you. I remember hearing Benny Hinn teach that. I walked in here and I stood right in the back. And I can tell you this, I was already healed. I just was slowly testing it out. Take communion, take communion. And I remember T.L. Osborne telling his congregation as a prophetic act to prove that you're healed. He said, do something that you couldn't do before. So I take communion and I'm like, okay, I'm feeling pretty good. And I felt like the Holy Spirit said, do what you, what you wouldn't think of doing if your back was hurt, hurting, and that's running. I don't wanna run ever for any reason. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> I took off running around here like a wild banshee. And I walked into that meeting and I, I could barely stand up because I was so winded. <laughs> They're like, are you okay? I'm like, yes, I'm good. <laughs> but my back doesn't hurt. <laughs> and it was gone just like that. Just, just like that. Hey, we've got to use the truth of what God has given us, the tools at, at our disposal to make war against the enemy. There should be something that makes us so angry when we see the enemy trying to step in. There's not time, there's not time 
for us to think about it and, and be sad about it and, and we want to grieve about what's happening. No. Be strong in the Lord. Genesis chapter 26. No, let's back up. Let's go to uh, Genesis chapter 18. I want, to, I want us to study through as quickly as possible some of these stories. And I want you to see in the Old Testament that what Jesus was doing, what our Heavenly Father was doing, I, I, I believe this strongly. This is one of my favorite stories in the entire Bible where Abraham identifies one like a son of man, capital A, angel, and two other angels, and I believe with all my heart, it was pre-incarnate Jesus. I believe it was the transfigure, uh, Jesus being transfigured on the Mount of Olives with Peter, James, and John. I believe Moses and Elijah show up. I believe that Jesus had, had been traveling through time, meeting with these people along the way. Abraham would not have known their names. He only identified them as two angels. But underneath the trees of Monre, Mamre, Abraham sees God show up in person. And he says, don't leave this place. Let me prepare a meal. And they wait. They prepare the meal. And I want you to look what happens. Let's, we're in Genesis chapter 18. Let's start with verse, um, I'll tell this part and then we'll read verse five. He tells his servants to go get a, a goat. They prepare the meal. He gets milk and butter. He brings it all together and they sit down and they have a meal. I want you to understand that you read Genesis chapter 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, you'll see the Lord making promises for years to Abraham. For years, he's making promises to him. He says, he says in chapter 12, look, look, as far as you can see, in all directions, as far as your eye can see, I'll give it to you. I'm gonna give you the land. He promises, I'm not just gonna give you a son, I'm gonna make you a a father to nations. He's promising them all of these things. For years, nothing happens. The promise lies dormant. But here, in 18, old man Abraham and Sarah have a, have a meal with the Lord. And look what happens in verse five. Genesis 18, verse five, and we'll go through 10. He says, and I will bring a morsel of bread that you may refresh your hearts. After that, you may pass by. And as much as you have come to your servant, they said, do as you have said. Abraham hurried into the tent to Sarah and said, quickly make ready three measures of fine meal. Knead it and make cakes. And Abraham ran to the herd, took a tender and good calf, gave it to the young man and he said, hey, and he hastened to prepare it. So he took butter and milk. And the calf which he had prepared wasn't a goat, it was a calf. Details matter. And he set it before them and stood by, under the tree, stood by them under the tree as they ate. Then they said to him, where is Sarah, your wife? So he said, here in the tent. And he said, I will certainly return to you according to the time of life. And behold, Sarah, your wife, shall have a son. They have the meal and he releases the promise. And he says, nine months time, now's the time. And it happened, it happened. It was, it, it was unlocked. The, that promise came to life at the table. Genesis chapter 26. Genesis chapter 26, Isaac is making a covenant with Abimelech. And he said, Genesis 26, verse 29. 
Can you back up one verse for me? But they said, we have certainly seen that the Lord is with you. So we said, let there be now an oath between us, between you and us, and let us make a covenant with you that you will do us no harm since we have not touched you and since we have done nothing to you but good and have sent you away in peace. You are now the blessed of the Lord. So he made them a feast and they ate and drank. Then they arose early in the morning and swore an oath with one another and Isaac sent them away and they departed from him in peace. The covenant was sealed by the meal. When you go to a wedding, we have a husband or a groom and a bride and they stand before the Lord and a bunch of witnesses and they make a covenant before God. And then we throw a party and we have a meal. It's prophetic, it's not just, it's not just tradition. Genesis chapter 31, same thing happens with Jacob, Jacob and Laban. Genesis 31, we'll start in verse 44. <clears throat> now therefore come, let us make a covenant, you and I, let it be a witness between you and me. So Jacob took a stone and set it up as a pillar. Then Jacob said to his brothers and sisters, gather stones, and they took stones and made a heap, and they ate there on the heap. The covenant was sealed by the meal. Exodus chapter 12, verse eight. Children of Israel are in bondage and the Lord has promised Abraham 420 years prior. He said, hey, your people, they're gonna go to a foreign land and they're gonna be in bondage there for, for years. And he says, but don't worry, I'm bringing them out. I'm bringing them out. The promise lied dormant for 420 years, but look what happens. Then they shall eat the flesh on that night. There's a meal, it's the Passover meal. You partake, they had to partake, they had to eat the lamb. Then they shall eat the flesh on that night, roasted in fire, with unleavened bread and with bitter herbs, they shall eat it. They take the, the Passover meal and 420 years of bondage end in less than 24 hours because Satan can't hold on to anything that's at the table. Exodus chapter 24, he's walked them out of bondage, but now it's time to be crossing over. Moses and Joshua and the elders, Nadab and Abihu, Exodus 24 verse 11, as they're getting preparing to cross over. The last thing they do before they take territory is they have a meal together. But on the nobles of the children of Israel, he did not lay his hands. So they saw God, they met with God, and they ate and drank, and they crossed over. 1 Kings 19. We see a very tired and weary Elijah. 1 Kings 19, verse one, starting in verse one. And Ahab told Jezebel all that Elijah had done, also how he had executed all the prophets with the sword. Then Jezebel sent a messenger to Elijah saying, so let the gods do to me and more also if I do not make your life as the life of one of them by tomorrow about this time. So he's receiving death threats from an evil, evil woman. And when he saw that, he arose and ran for his life and went to Beersheba, which belongs to Judah, and left his servant there. But he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness and came and sat down under a broom tree and he prayed that he might die and said, it is enough. Now, Lord, take my life for I am no better than my father's. This guy has just had the greatest victory in the history of victories. 
Then as he lay and slept under a broom tree, suddenly an angel touched him. I believe with all my heart that this is a pre-incarnate Jesus that shows up with Elijah. Said to him, arise and eat. And he looked. How many of you are following along in your Bible and angel is capitalized? Some versions do it differently. The angel of the Lord. Then he looked and there by his head was a cake baked on coals and a jar of water. So he ate and drank and lay down again. The angel of the Lord came back the second time and touched him and said, arise and eat because the journey is too great for you. So he arose and ate and drank and he went in the strength of that food 40 days, 40 nights, as far as Horeb, the mountain of God. There he went into a cave and spent the night in that place. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him and he said to him, what are you doing here, Elijah? So he said, I've been very zealous for the Lord, for the Lord God of hosts, for the children of Israel have forsaken the covenant and torn down your altars and killed your prophets with the sword. I alone am left and they seek to take my life. Then he said, go out and stand on the mountain before the Lord and behold, the Lord passed by and a great strong wind tore into the mountains. You know the, the story. It's The Lord is making Renewing covenant with Elijah. Luke chapter 22, 19 and 20. We move forward to the New Testament. It's the same, the same Jesus showing up. He goes to a wedding. They make a covenant there before the Lord, but at that wedding, they've all been eating a meal and they come to Jesus and say, hey, we don't have anything more left to drink for this, for this covenant day. Jesus there breaks the seal on miracles right after a meal. I don't think that's coincidence. In Luke 22, verse 19, Jesus is sitting with his disciples. He ate with them all the time. Can you imagine getting to eat with meals with Jesus like every day for, for well, almost every, like on a weekly basis for three years? Wouldn't that be awesome? But it's always over a meal that he's, he's teaching and, and, and loosing destiny into their life. He took the bread, gave thanks, and he broke it. He gave it to them saying, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Likewise, he took the cup after supper saying, this is the cup of the new covenant in my blood, which is shed for you. He's teaching them, this is how you break through the promises. Jesus has given us the greatest tool in our hands to meet with him at any given time to release promises that we don't see happening in our life. Take communion serious. Take communion serious. Be intentional. Take communion. Declare God's promise. Have the elements there. Do communion and remind the Lord, Lord, I'm here today and I'm taking communion. I'm coming to the table with you. I'm here to have a meal with you. How about this? During fasting and prayer, it's okay to do communion. Remind the Lord of what he's promised. I heard Benny Hinn talking about this and he was talking about uh, parents with prodigal children. He said, pray and declare prodigal children the promises of the Lord, remind the Lord of his promises and then take communion. Decla declare that they're saved in Jesus' name and then do communion. Look at how many times Jesus is having meals. The meals that he's having with the people is unlocking blessing and favor in their life. Very intentional. He finds Zacchaeus, we can sing the song. Zacchaeus, you come down, for I'm going to your house today. But what do they do? They go have a meal. He sits down 
at Matthew's house. They have a meal. What's he doing? He's releasing covenant. He's like, hey, tax collector man, you've been lying and, and cheating. You've been a traitor to your own people. How many of you have watched The Chosen? The story of Matthew really kind of comes alive when you understand the politics of what would have been happening. I love the way they depict Matthew. He feeds the 5,000. Miracles are breaking forth every time that Jesus is eating a meal. He raises from the dead. He tell, he's raised from the dead. The first person that sees him is Mary. The story as it goes in the gospel of Luke we can go to Luke chapter 24. He sees Mary, he says, don't touch me yet. I haven't gone to my father. And the next thing that we find, he's on the road to Emmaus with two guys that don't even recognize him. He preaches the gospel to them. Just waiting all the way on this road for an invitation to do what? Hey, come in and eat with us. Jesus knew what he was doing the whole time. He gets to the meal, and let's pick up in Luke chapter 24, verse 30. He sees them, and they don't even recognize him yet. He says, now it came to pass as he sat at the table with them, that he took the bread, blessed it, and broke it, and gave it to them. And then their eyes were opened. Spiritual blindness ended the moment that, they, that he sat at the table with them and took the bread. They recognized Jesus they, they knew what it looked like when he would take the, be, the bread and he would bless it and he would break it and then he would spread it out. He did it at the feeding of the 5,000, the feeding of the 4,000. He did it on the night that he was betrayed, the Last Supper in John 13. And then here he is again. It's just not that long, just a few days later. And they're like, my goodness, this is him. Then their eyes are opened and he commissions them. The same story is happening in John chapter 20 where Jesus tells them, peace be with you, peace be unto you. As the Father has sent me, so I send you. He commissions them and sends us out. He's, he is the great apostle and, and the apostolic mantle is released upon them at the table. Every promise activates by faith and with a meal with the Lord. Never take communion lightly. The bread and the wine create a union with us and Christ. The bread and the wine together are a covenant door into another world of covenant exemption. Jesus lost lots of followers on the day that he stood in the in the synagogue in Capernaum in John chapter six and he's telling them things that made no sense to them. He says, you have to eat my flesh and drink my blood. And everybody's like, say what? They're not getting it. They're looking around. I, I love reading John chapter six. I encourage you to read it in uh, either King James or New King James because it's just funny the way they word it. Mm, this is a hard teaching. So it says, this is a hard teaching. Who can understand it? And it says, and many turned away from him from that moment because they're like, oh, that's too far. Like we can get with the miracles. We can get with this. We can get that. But now you want us to eat your flesh and drink your blood. Well, he's speaking to them of spiritual things. They didn't understand at the time that God wanted to be one with them and that when we would eat the meal, as a spiritual act of prophetically coming into union with Christ, that miracles in the supernatural would explode in our life. Paul figured it out and tried to teach it to all of us. Tried to teach it to the Corinthian church. He said, there's many people that are doing, that, that are taking the Passover meal, but they don't discern the body of Christ. And he says, this is why that many of you are sick and many of you sleep. There are, Paul, the apostle Paul said, people are sick, they're remaining sick because they don't understand the communion table. He says, if you'll learn to discern the body of Christ, you can walk free from sickness and disease. Let 
Let's be the church that's telling this to the world and manifesting signs, wonders, and miracles, not just a little pop-up healing here and there, but what happens when an entire congregation gets intoxicated with the reality of communion and starts just walking free of sickness and disease? Well, David, it doesn't work that way. We'll say things like that and it'll never work that way. You'll guarantee, I guarantee you it won't. We have a whole teaching on that called your mouth might be ruining it. <laughs> I was teaching this this morning on the broadcast. It's imperative that we align our thought life with the truth that's in God's word. And in the meantime, while you're letting that faith be built and let the word of God and the truth seep in and come alive in your spirit, it's important to keep your mouth shut until you can line your mouth up with what the word is saying. It's real important. But when you can... Get your thoughts to be lined up with God's word. Man, open wide your mouth and start declaring out what the Lord has promised and start doing what he's told you to do and watch the blessing and favor explode. Watch the miracles. Think of it. Think of how wonderful it is that Jesus has made it so simple for us. I, I, I've had this thought and I think it's a, a really bad theology thought. I, I told you this at the beginning of the teaching. I love the story of Abraham and Jesus and the two angels showing up under the trees of Mon Re. I love this story. It's so fascinating to me. And I've often said to myself, man, how awesome would it be? I said it even in this teaching and I've got to like stop saying it. Wouldn't it be awesome to have a meal with Jesus? Can you imagine having a meal with Jesus for for three years, like in flesh and blood. And that would be exciting. But Jesus left us with communion where we, every single day, you can have a meal with him. He literally says, just come to the table. Just come to the table by faith and don't do it lightly. He doesn't say, remember this. He says, do this. What does that mean? What does that mean? This is one of the things that we've been teaching to our church is that when we do communion, we don't just think about, Lord, we thank you for the blood and we thank you for the bread. We don't just sing, oh, the blood of Jesus. No. Close your eyes. And picture, picture, walk through it. Do the Passover meal in Exodus was a foretelling. It was a type. It was a shadow. The lamb was Jesus. Picture the Passover. Picture the lamb of God being born. Picture the lamb of God teaching and, and healing everybody. Picture the lamb of God being taken and arrested and beaten and see him bleeding, walk the road. We were supposed to go to Israel like a week and a half before the war broke out over there. I'd never, I've never been still. I wanted to walk the road. I wanted to walk the road so that every time I came to the table, I could go back there and remember. Jesus walking. I wanted to see what the streets looked like so that communion could be even more real. So to see the place. This do. The Lord has given us, he's blessed us with great creativity and imagination. At the table, we can go there in our mind. We can picture what's happening. Reenact in your mind the atonement. Participate spiritually with the crucifixion of Jesus. See him dying for you. See him bleeding for you every time you do communion. Bring the suffering of Christ 2,000 years ago into your present 
and then, un, and then understand all of that suffering he did on, so that the curse could be broken for you. Galatians 3, 13 and 14, but Christ has redeemed us from all the curse of the law. That scripture right there should cause you to start shouting. Christ has redeemed us from all of the curse of the law. The curse of the law is what brings sickness and disease. Curse of the law is what brings confusion and division in families. The curse of, the curse of sin. All of those things are a result of sin and Jesus came and he broke all of it. So what are you facing tonight? What, where are you at in life where you, need, where you need to be able to come to the table? By faith, when you're doing communion, release the atonement into your body. What does that mean? David, I don't know how to release the atonement into my body. Think about it, what it means. Think about it in your thoughts and, 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 and let the revelation of what Jesus has really done come alive in your spirit, man. One of my favorite quotes, it's one of the boldest quotes that I have heard as it relates to communion. Benny Hinn says it. He says, you cannot remain sick when communion is done correctly. He said this in his book as well. The only, he, he said that Pentecostals have gone, largely have gone the way of a very religious communion. He said the only communion service that gets mocked and ridiculed by the satanic church like Satanists is the Catholic communion because they take it very, very serious. We should take it very serious too. Take it seriously. Whatever, you, whatever you're facing tonight, I wanna challenge you. I, I thought about, well, we can do this all together. And we, we, we could, we will continue to do communion together in church. But I, I want you to take responsibility in this. And if you're facing a situation where you need Jesus at the table with you, then you get alone with the Lord at the table. I'll provide the elements for you. They're out here. You can do it before you leave. You can take some home, but I wanna challenge you. Get to the table and don't just chug some juice and eat a cracker. Take some time and participate with what Jesus went through. Have a heart of true thankfulness for what he's done and then ask him. Jesus, here's the promises that I, that, that I, I, I need you to make good on. And I declare that ha this has to be done. The truth of God's word has to be the truth of my life. And declare it to be so and don't doubt. And then come tell me, we wanna hear the testimonies. Amen. Lift your hands to the Lord. Let me pray for you. Father, in Jesus' name, I pray that tonight would be a turning point in our, uh, in our lives, in our, in our church. I pray that we would see the communion table different. Lord, I pray we never take it lightly. Lord, teach us what it means. Holy Spirit, we need you to be our teacher, to help us to understand the mystery of discerning the, the body and the blood. May we never be the same. I thank you for an outbreak of miracles in 2024. And I thank you that as our church contends for the things of God, I thank you, Lord Jesus, that you're leading us on an incredible, incredible journey. Bless these people. May the favor of the Lord be upon each and every one. In Jesus' name, amen. 
Amen. We love you. We can't wait to see you on Sunday. If you're joining us online, come join us this Sunday with Luke Holter. It's going to be a wonderful time of uh, laughing and ministry. Good times. We love you guys, and uh, we can't wait to see you again soon. Tell somebody you love them and that they look nice tonight on your way out.